Um, <laughs> so I was just talking to Mary about really what it means to come out spiritually. And I really feel the call that this is the time to come out spiritually. And what I mean by that is, um, Mary and I were just chatting about this, how like when we are young people, when we're little kids, some of you might remember what that was like. Uh, we were like God light, right? We were just like God goddess beams of shining bright light. We had no idea um, what it meant to really like be fully human yet because we were just this amazing, I don't know, you know, we're a combination of like stars and God and whatever, whatever you believe in, right? And then along the way, as we grow up, uh, we get into our teenage years, somebody tells us that's weird or wrong. And so we shut down, you know, or maybe you grew up, I grew up Catholic. Did you grow up in a church, Mary? <laughs> so a little bit. And I, I, you know, I went to Lutheran school. It was really fun. I was actually just having a chat with a friend of mine on the phone last night. And we were talking about like the transition between growing up in a parochial school and then going to a public high school. So that was kind of fun. So I have confirmed we've got it all hooked up for Facebook Live and I'm going to, um, I know like you're kind of in the middle of a story, but I was going to just uh, jump right in here yeah. and say who you are and who, what we were going to talk about today. So I have to read, it's kind of long, so I have to read it from my notes. So as you might have already guessed, Christina Miglino is going to reveal her fiercely compassionate protocol for stepping into your divine purpose and trusting your intuition so that you are not only in alignment with your soul's mission, but you're also manifesting abundance everywhere in your life. Now, I actually met Christina because she was one of the first people that I ever did an online summit with. So I had a really great time. Her and I had a super strong connection. And so we've been planning this event for quite a while, like maybe even eight or nine months. And she also took my aspiring authors course. And um, this is sort of the culmination between our relationship growing, her taking the aspiring authors course, and now she's working on her very own book. So I'm like a proud mama over here. And um, Christina is a soul catalyst, like a true shamanic practitioner and higher consciousness channel. So I want to hear more about that because channeling is fascinating. Mm -hmm. She works primarily with artists, healers, and visionaries to heal and release wounds that bind them in order to liberate our souls to do what we are meant to do on the planet. Now, I really understand this, especially because like recently I've been able to understand trauma Mm -hmm. and how trauma lodges into our DNA. And it really causes like epigenetic uh, mutations in our gene expression, which eventually leads to illnesses, all kinds of things, fibromyalgia, autoimmune disorders. You know, there's just some weird things happening to us medically that we don't really understand how to treat. And so we've got all of these like soul catalysts and practitioners coming out and explaining that when we can heal, when we can truly heal from these traumas, traumas, it's like we can remove the, the trauma from our DNA and allow our gene expression to like naturally express itself in its original form, allowing us to become more of who we really are. And, you know, another thing is like, we're constantly covering up who we are really meant to be. And like the whole purpose is to step even more into who you really are. So, all right, I'm going to let Christina take it back away. I'm just uh, so excited to have you here this morning. I'm so excited to be with you, Mary. I mean, seriously, like you have no idea. You've been such an inspiration in my life. Oh my God. Tell me about it while I'm like, <laughs> right. I mean, really no. that. I mean, we'll get back to the, the story I was telling before, but just, um, I've really declared writing a book actually like in the last couple of weeks. Awesome. Brand new. So spiritually coming out will be the book title, um, is the book title and the book proposal is starting right now. And so you, your work and what you created, I'm endlessly grateful for. I've been watching you and like studying. So I'm just, I think about your story. I think about our connection. You were the first person who said yes to me on my first online summit. That is profound. It is because now we're circling back to a time where my business is going, your book is like amazing, you know, it's like all, it's all blossoming and, and it's just special to be back here with you. So, so great. I, I agree. You were, you were definitely one of my first online, online summits too. And I just remember being super impressed with you from our very first, um, 
phone call because you were into a lot of the things that I'm into that I believe really do make changes in your subconscious mind, you know, things like hypnosis therapy. And, and so, yeah, I mean, all the things that you're doing are, are really making a dent in healing the people, which is what is healing the planet ultimately. And, you know, that, that whole thing is the more that we can clear out or defrag our subconscious, the more that it, it's just easier to step into who you really are. So, all right, let's, uh, okay. So we are talking about parochial school. You grew up Catholic. Yeah, I grew up Catholic, which actually as a little kid, I was a devout Catholic. Like I prayed every night. Me too. You know, like I really got it, you know, and I still, I think there is a place for that. Um, Since then, so what happened for me, and I come from very Catholic parents who now also have moved away from the church, but have also come out about their own spiritual beliefs and gifts, which I think is fascinating. Um, So I'm kind of following suit. But yeah, so somewhere along the way, a lot of us shut down some of our spiritual gifts, the things that the things that we notice that are maybe unseen, untangible things. And we stop talking about it, you know, because you don't go to middle school and go, hey, you guys, I totally saw a ghost last night. You know, like that's not the conversations we're having in school. Um, and so later on in, in our lives, I really believe, especially right now in time, it has everything to do with this moment in history. We are being called to come out about our spirituality and the ways we can serve each other. Because you're right, it is about it is about going into the unconscious, defragging that con- unconsciousness and being able to actually release wounds. We've dealt with cycles of woundedness for a very long time. And now we're actually, I believe we're being called to actually release those cycles and start. That's why, that's why in the spiritual community, you hear a lot about the new earth, the new earth. We're creating the new earth, right? And that's what it means. We're creating a new way of being on the planet. And that's calling for us to be really out about who we are. So what that looked like for me is to finally, my whole life, I have felt like more spirit than body. Totally. Like even as a little kid, and this isn't true. Some people, you meet them and they're like, I had a spiritual awakening. I never thought about spirit until I saw the, you know, some, some spirit came to me and spoke to me or something like that. And then they awoke as an adult. For me, it was like ongoing. I had a huge moment as an eight-year-old in the hospital where I saw I was not doing well. I actually was praying. I remember the night it happened, praying that I would not be here anymore. I I suffered from migraine headaches. I was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Um, I was put in a child psych ward because they had no idea what to do with me. They didn't know what was wrong how to heal my pain. I was really suffering. I couldn't even get out of my bed. I would just cry and cry and cry. And one night I was just like, please God, I cannot be in a body anymore. Take me away from this, please. I was eight, you know, like it's crazy. So I go to bed one night, I'm praying about this and I literally blast off into one of those like, you know, people that have near death experiences talk about the bright light, right? exactly like in the movies bright light i'm fully in this light i'm zooming through space and all of a sudden these two enormous angels present themselves to me and i'm just like oh my god like how is it i mean very catholic looking you know like gowns and instruments and and all of this and they're like you're not going you're meant to be here you're meant to help people you're gonna be okay oh so the short story of it But what happened is I had that experience and it totally shifted everything for me. I got out of bed. I drew a picture of these angels. I put it on my wall. Like I was like, I'm, I'm going to save myself. You know, I was in a psych ward. All the adults around me thought I was nuts or just wrote me off. You know, that's just how it is in there. And I got myself out of there and I ended up getting healed somewhat. I still get migraine headaches, but I'm working on that as well right now. Um, But so like in my younger years, I didn't go back to that. As I went into junior high and high school, I wasn't like, hey, you guys, I saw angels. Cool. High five. Like I'm not, I, I, that's not how I made friends, you know, because I thought that's way too weird. Nobody's going to get it. And so it wasn't until 
you know, my 20s, I started studying to be a shamanic practitioner, started studying energy medicine. I was always really called to the work, but really it was this year. And I, it's, it's funny that I turned 33 this year. It's like my Jesus year, right? I have fully <laughs> come out about, oh my gosh, like I am living my life. And I bet you can relate to this through my heart and my intuition more than my woundedness or my brokenness or my stories, you know? So and what, what I can like really attest to is a lot of times, and this is something that I've been developing with myself is like the concept of living through my heart instead of my head. And when you're totally in your head, especially like if you're a CEO, you're an entrepreneur, then you don't even understand the concept of not being in your head. And so like through a series of my own mystical events that, that have happened, like, and I've had my, my own sort of, you know, spiritual coming out and, and mm -hmm. seeing the light, so to speak. But what I'm really super interested in to, to just to, to focus on just for a minute yeah. is, um, as an eight-year-old and being in a, psych a, a psychiatric ward, there has to be a certain amount of trauma associated just with that event at eight years old and to be so misunderstood, to be misdiagnosed. And you had to have on some level believed that you were crazy, you know, because all of these people who were big people yeah. And you're just a little person around you are, are treating you as if you're crazy and also they're writing you off. And so that had to have been, I just can't even imagine how terrifying of a trauma that that was to suffer through. And, you know, so when we're talking about like these, these traumas in our bodies, you know, one of the things that I'm really beginning to deeply understand is trauma is not necessarily about the thing that happened in the past, because that is actually in the past. It's not occurring in our our present moment, but it is about the way that it shows up in our present day. So how is the trauma affecting you in the present day? And what I'm finding like super fascinating about what you're talking about is that it's almost like you have reformed or you have reintegrated this trauma as a spiritual awakening and a shamanic awakening and allowed that be to be your catalyst, but it could have equally went the other way where the shame and unworthiness of what happened to you at eight years old completely overtook your life and where you would actually just step into and become that person or become that statistic of what you should have become. Now, you know, as your migraines got better and, you know, people saw your behavior change, obviously that means they took you out of the psych ward and, and things started to shift for you, but that doesn't change the fact that it happened. Right. And I can't imagine like, you know, we were talking about making friends and middle school and all of that. So like on, and, and there's this other part of me that like, I can't imagine what it must've been like, because this is something that you probably wanted to keep hidden. You wouldn't have yeah. wanted to tell your friends that you were in a psych ward. So like, I'm, I could have a million questions just about that, but, um, definitely I'm following your story. It's a great story. Thank you so much for being brave and sharing that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's talk about shame and abandonment. I, I didn't have really, um, an abandonment story before that happened. And I didn't even know because my twenties were not, not an easy ride. Like I definitely know what you mean. Like I really owned that. I was such a victim. I, I was such a victim in some of my, you know, romantic relationships that I created. Um, and when I, so the nice thing is, is my, I've always spiritually been a studier, like a student, right? So I put myself in a meditation and attachment theory year long course so that I could really get, I mean, this is probably where we connect the most is like, I really got how the trauma was affecting me and my brain, right? My thoughts and my daily uh, experiences of who I was and who my partner was and the life I was creating. And I remember doing, so in attachment theory, Mary, I don't know if you've had experience with this, but there's like a very particular interview that you can have done. And somebody who has to be actually trained to do this interview with you to tell you exactly what your attachment style was, is. Anyway, part of this course, I got to do the interview and the woman's asking me questions. And this was just a couple of years ago. 
And she's like, talk to me about your childhood. And I started telling this story and I just completely emotionally, like I just started sobbing. And I know that the interview is set up to help you discover things. And I just was like, oh my God, I was abandoned. I mean, that's what I felt, you know? I was eight. Like, who was standing for me? I had two parents that loved me, but they lived hours away from the hospital. I wasn't being visited every day, you know? So you're so right. Like, I, I, my 20s were, like, rough. A mess. A mess. Yeah, they were, you know, all kinds of things, all kinds of physical illness showing up, all kinds of um, anxiety attacks. I used to have debilitating anxiety attacks, like literally fall on the floor, can't breathe, don't know if I'm going to live through it kind of thing. Wow. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's incredibly brave that you've gone through that. And it makes me, um, there's somebody I want to connect you with. So remind me after the show, I can't remember the name off of the top of his head, but he has a really cool podcast and he really focuses on like people who have recovered from anxiety. So I have a feeling he would love to hear what you have to say. And, um, I've been on his podcast. He's a really super great host. So I think he would love to have you on. Um, on the show. So, you know, like, yeah. So feeling, I mean, in, in, in the twenties and in the time when you were a mess, it probably like felt like it was really spiraling out of control and like, you didn't really have a lot of control over what was happening to you. So what did your attachment style turn out to be? Preoccupied. <laughs> what, and tell us what that means. And also if you know what the other attachment styles are, we could go over those too. Sure. Yeah. So, um, so in attachment theory, there's, um, there's basically like healthy attachment, which is the people who grow up with two parents who are really present and not a lot of trauma in their childhood. It's not most of us, I would say. I mean, they say it's about, you know, research says that it's like maybe about 60%, uh, sorry, 50 it's like half and half. Mm -hmm. that are on the, you know, organized, healthy side. And then the rest of us, the rest of us are on the like disorganized or not just not really disorganized, but like, um, have struggled, you know, we've, we've had some struggles. Attachment style also is defined by the first couple of years of your life. So this isn't like, you know, you don't really pick it. It's whatever it is. For me, I am preoccupied attachment style, which means that um, my primary caregiver, which was my mother, um, she got a lot out of having me close by her. So I grew up not really wanting to explore that much because actually being close to my mother meant that I was helping regulate her emotions. Mom, if you're listening, I love you. It's, <laughs> it's totally all good, right? Like this is true of many, many, many people. And I know many people that are, that have the preoccupied style because the parent actually just like kind of needed the child close by for their, for their own, you know, they probably thinking that like the world is unsafe. So, you know, making sure you're taken care of, but also that. Um, Christina, keep talking. I'm just, um, I, do you see that on the screen where I'm sharing this, this book? Yes. Oh, this so, is great. Yeah. So keep talking. Um, I just want to share with the audience. This is a book that I have actually purchased that is about exactly what you're talking about. Um, yeah. This book is super highly recommended. And I will be honest, I have bought this book, but I have not actually read it yet. It's kind of like my, my book list is so far behind um, and I, I was like, I went through one year and I read like 55 books in a year. And then I started writing myself. And as you know, when you're writing, you don't always, um, you don't always have time to read and, and, and partially you don't want to. So yeah. this, this book, um, this was highly recommended to me. I am not recommending it necessarily because I haven't read it yet, but I just want to put it up here. So if you want to know more about attachment theory, I have been told that this is the go-to book. So um, I'll just share that for the audience. And now I've got to figure out how to stop you, sharing. Mary, before you do that, that book Wired for Love that says Frequently Bought Together. Yeah, yeah, this one. I have read that book. That is this also about attachment? It is. And this is Stan Tatkin. 
I just studied Stan Totkin. I don't know him. Um, but I do know that he works with relationship and attachment theory. And I'm telling you, if you, if you want to be, if you want to stay in your relationship and you have any questions about whether that's possible or not, this is the man. <laughs> if you don't want to get your ass dumped. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to keep, you know, if you're in a marriage or if you're in a, I mean, All right. man, I was in a, I was in. Um, Let me add this to my list really quick. Yeah, oh, not even signed on. All right. It's freaking awesome. That book is amazing. And it's cool because it's short and it's got very specific um, like protocols for exercises you can do around, well, if my attachment style is this and my partner's is this, how can we communicate? That's what it's about. So what are the, so what are some of the ways, and um, I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing this and bring you back on the screen. What are some of the ways, if you have a preoccupied attachment style, um, what are, what are the ways that that shows up in your life? How does that affect you? Great question. Um, so preoccupation can play out like the martyr. Oh, ah, okay. To that? <laughs> the martyr, the overgiver, the person who gets sort of something out of being the caretaker, mm -hmm. right? Because that's the definition is like being the emotional caretaker from a very young age. So maybe this is where like Munchausen syndrome stems from. <laughs> like, seriously. I mean, no doubt. So that was a terrible joke. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's, it's very, it's fascinating like how this shows up in your life. And then in relationship, what does that mean? Like I've created relationships where, um, in my relationship with a man, like he's the child and I'm the parent and, and you have to save him. But yeah, exactly. Like that's not sexy. You know, like that's not, that's not the relationship that I want to be in. That's not the partnership, romantic partnership I want to be in. So yeah, get, it's about taking radical responsibility. I talk about that all the time. That's something that I really work with my clients on is taking radical responsibility for your soul. So not just like, you know, what you're having for lunch today, like literally you chose your parents, you know, you chose the people to show up in your life to be your teachers. So when you start to see your life that way, you really take the power back from situations right? Like when you think about yourself as the creator of your life versus the victim of your life, I mean, this has been the big aha for me. Like talk about abundance, but I couldn't touch abundance when I was in that relationship. You know, it was all scarcity, everything. Right. Yeah. And well, and I, I know with attachment styles, there's also one where, where you are like super attached, where you're, you know, if you're coming from an abandonment mode, then there's like a non-attachment style where, and I don't remember all the names, so I can't even speak on it because yeah. if I would have maybe read a little bit of a refresher about those, I could. But one of the things that I will say is that, um, you know, I was just at a healing retreat in Peru and definitely during one of the, um, during one of the evenings where in this retreat center that I was at, we, I totally um, did experience that like pre-birth planning sort of session. And one of the things that I was shown, and this is, this was really odd for me, but one of the things that I was shown is that I actually um, chose some gifts to have for this lifetime. So it was like telling me like, remember, remember, like you, you asked for, to have like this level of high intelligence and you asked to have this universal knowledge that you can show that you can share with the world. And so like, I totally understand now more, even more the need to write a book and the need to yeah. share that stuff, because as you are sharing your gifts, you're really, you know, that's what you were meant to do. But I think that there's this like disconnect between being able to even understand what our gifts are. Yeah. Yeah. How do you even understand what they are? I mean, it's a really good question. Um, and I would say one of the things that I think is kind of fun to do, Mary, and I don't know if this shows up for you as you think about your childhood and growing up, like what are, what's something that people have always told you? They've always told you you're good at, they've always um, noticed something about you, even in like, you know, you go back to like parent teacher conferences, nobody wants to go back to that. <laughs> Sorry to bring it up, but you know, like, 
what what did it, what are the teachers saying? What are your friends saying? If if your friends could describe you, what are they what are they gonna say? You know, it's hard to think about. We don't we don't frame things that way because for a lot of us, we don't want to be egotistical or we don't want to. You know, it's like, but what would they really say if they were complimenting you? Like, Mary, or, or not a compliment, but sometimes a criticism. So or, the things, yeah, because right. yeah, the things that come to mind for me are like talks too much, talks too much, talks okay, too much. Go. Yeah. Well, guess what? Now I'm a public speaker and I've been on like 250 podcasts and I've written a book, but I was highly criticized for like talks too much, you know, so that, that, that ability to be vulnerable and share what was on my mind, because apparently I was a natural storyteller that was sort of squashed. And right. Also, I was very different because I had all these very mystical beliefs from a super young age. Like I was, I was more interested in what was happening in ancient Egypt than what was happening, you know, like in modern totally. culture. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And so, and so you, you had people, even if it was not in a positive way, people pointing to your gifts your whole life, you know? And so for you, it had to be about taking what was fed to you as like um, your downfall, right? Of like talking too much. And then that got to be transmuted into your biggest gifts. And I love thinking about it. Like, if you think about yourself as a flower in a garden, like what do we do when we're, when we're getting ready to plant seeds? We're like, you know, we grab the fertilizer, the shit, right? We're mixing it into the, <laughs> and then we plant these seeds and out of the seed comes this absolutely, miraculous, brightly colored miracle of a flower, right? And so that's what we get to do in our lives. We take the fertilizer and it looks like shit, <laughs> you know? It can look like a really hard, tricky, traumatizing life. But if we can, if we can connect it to our biggest gifts, then it's like we, we literally like take the chains off, right? We unshackle ourselves. And we, I talk about it like taking our power back because I work shamanically, which is all about taking power back from any situations. That's why I've studied trauma so much from any situations that where we've given it away or where somebody's taken it from us, right? And then we can live out more fully expressed our soul's mission here, which is what you're doing. Yeah. So here's something, I mean, if, if people know me or are familiar with me at all, I'm really fascinated with the Hebrew alphabet and for, for many, many reasons, but I was watching a talk on YouTube and it was this rabbi and I think his name was uh, rabbi Eric Kraft and he's a super cool guy. Mm. And one of the things that he was talking about is he, and, and I don't know if this is like a common, uh, if this is like what every person in the Jewish faith believes, or if this is just very specific to this rabbi. And I really think that this rabbi was more into like the mystical end of things. So like Jewish mysticism more so than on the Orthodox side. So what was interesting is he was saying that how a lot of the words are constructed in the Hebrew alphabet or the Hebrew language is how a word can be translated backwards and frontwards. So it has one meaning going forward and one meaning going backwards. Mm -hmm. And what really caught my attention was when he said that the the word for troubles in the Hebrew language, when you do that meaning backwards, it means awakening. Unbelievable. I mean, that's just like exactly what you said. It's like the, the fertilizer shit, you know, so that sometimes the things that you think are your greatest struggles are your greatest awakenings. Like for example, um, my son who is 18 years old, his name is Keegan. He is on the aut autism spectrum and he got diagnosed somewhere between like the second and third grade. And I was in just total shock and denial over this diagnosis. Um, you know, I had already lived through the loss of my daughter who passed away from a, a very traumatic brain injury that happened at birth and she lived for a year and a half. But, you know, again, so like I had the same level of trauma, like living in the children's hospitals. Um, I was 19 years old. I was barely, like, I really wasn't an adult myself. Myself. And I was um, taking care of this baby who was for like, especially the first days and weeks of her life was completely on life support. And I was not processing what was happening. So when my son got this diagnosis, it just 
really put me back into the trauma of what was going on with my daughter. And I saw this, like this, these issues of autism, like in the way that, that we were having to fight in the school system and all of these things that were happening, I always saw them as like such a trauma or such a, like I was a victim to it. And then really now that he's 18 and he's like extremely brilliant and he's such a gift, not only to me, but to the world, what I see the gift or the awakening as. So the trouble is really an awakening is that when you are raising a child on the spectrum or, or maybe even if you're raising any kind of special needs child or you're a caregiver of someone that has needs, that it really served for me to shake off every belief system that I ever had, because you have to start letting go of these belief systems. Like for example, you know, I, my belief system was I was going to have a big strapping boy who was going to be on the football team and he was going to play sports and he was going to be smart and handsome and chase girls and you know and guess what i did not get that i got the kid that like his superpower is solving a rubik's cube in 20 seconds and <laughs> but for a long time i was not okay with that you know that and and he did weird things and he any he, any he, and he was inappropriate in a lot of ways and i had to like work around all of this stuff to just like get him through school but i really like what it did for me was it sure it served to literally like violently shake off all of these belief systems that I had. And I can tell you that I would not be in the same place if it weren't for this just beautiful gift of raising my son who um, is, is going to do amazing, great things. And like, it's so incredible to watch him live a life of freedom without all of these belief systems that the rest of us quite honestly are cursed with. Mm hmm. Well, and yeah, and isn't that like the miracle of it is like he came here for a reason, you know, there's autism is part of his story for a reason and he's here to awaken us. Yeah. And uh, I mean, autism, in my opinion, I mean, it, we could, we could have like a whole five hour session on autism, but you know, there, there is a big part of me that definitely believes that they are here on, on some level to heal the planet. And yeah. I, I don't quite understand it and I can't conceptualize it very, very well, but I think that they are very special, um, high vibrational beings that are doing some important work. And I'm just so grateful for them giving their, giving yeah. their lifetime to uh, help the rest of us to evolve. They're Bodhisattvas. Do you know Bodhisattvas? No, Buddhism? tell me. So Bodhisattvas in Buddhism, if you study Buddhism at all, are the souls that essentially ascend, like they basically get to the end of their ascension and they choose to come back. So it's not for them a reincarnation because they have to because mm -hmm. their souls like needing to go learn more. It's because they're coming back to teach. And so there are bodhisattvas walking this planet right now who are here supporting us and supporting our, our spiritual growth in a massive way. So that might be your son. That's pretty incredible. Yeah, he, he, he's definitely, I'm, I'm really proud of him. So, okay. After your twenties, let's start to pivot the story back into like, how do you go from all of this tragedy that you were experiencing and work through it? Like have that awakening be become, so tell us about like becoming the catalyst. And then I want to go over like the inspiration for your book. And then we'll talk about how people can find you and hook up with you. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, the story goes that I've always been seeking some kind of teacher. Like for me, it was like, first it had to be a spiritual teacher. And then I also knew from a very young age, although I was a great student, whatever that means, like I was, you know, straight A's, read all the books, whatever, whatever. Um, I also knew that everything I was studying in school, there was something else. There was always something else that I was going to find within finding a spiritual teacher. So I did that. I lived in San Francisco at the time. I studied at a place called the Foundation of the Sacred Stream with a woman named Issa Guchardi, who I adore. Um, she's amazing. But that's who I studied with to like study shamanism, study Buddhism, study energy medicine. I basically took all their classes in between two other jobs that I was <laughs> right it was like no this is my like I went and got a part of a master's degree and it didn't work out and then I was like oh no this is my master's degree 
I don't need to go back to that like other school. What I need is is to be committed. To my well, own. and so and just to just to point out too, when we were talking about like figuring out what your gifts are or what your purpose here is, that it is those things that you just you 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 catch on to them and it's almost like it becomes an obsession and you just want more and more and you become this sponge and you want to just ingest as much of this information as possible until you want to empower yourself with it by understanding in understanding it inside outside backwards and forwards yeah. and it sounds like that's what you were doing so thank you yeah yeah absolutely and i think some of that you know we can catch on to that in our lives too and we're really honest with ourselves about what what is really attracting us? Because one thing I think that we're doing when we do that sponge thing and then we absorb so much information at once is what I believe is like, we're, we're really reconnecting with something we've known for a very long time, right? Like beyond lifetime. So it's just that we, we wake up to it. We become conscious of it. And when we do that, that's what people call like downloads. Like when I channel and I'm downloading, all it is, is like, oh my gosh, this energy is moving through me. And it's like, instead of taking a six month course, I just figured it out. You know, it's just there. And it's not about being smart. It's just about being an open channel for, you know, trusting that I am divinely connected to source or universe or God or whatever you want to call it. Well, and even if, you know, even if you don't you're not inclined, inclined to believe any of that stuff. Like I was having, so I have a very close friend and she's a geneticist and a neurologist. And so like when she talks about like these concepts of spirituality, what makes the most sense for her is that it's already encoded into our DNA. Yeah. And so like as a geneticist, and by the way, she's like not just a geneticist, but she's one of the top 50 geneticists in the entire world. And, um, she was like, we were having this very same conversation the other night at dinner and we were talking about it. And she said, well, like the way that makes sense to me is that the DNA is potentially carrying all the ancestral code of any relative that you have ever, that has ever been in your bloodline. And so this goes back, you know, thousands of generations. And so isn't it possible that through meditation or through your life experiences that you're tapping in? So this is again, just like for people who don't, want to believe in universe or God or whatever, and you're just completely atheist, isn't it possible that you're tapping into some sort of coding and it feels like a download because people use that word often. And I have used that word. And especially when you start writing, the downloads will begin to increase. And it's really, really cool because it's all of a sudden, like the stuff just starts appearing and the synchronicities go through the roof. But isn't it possible that all of this stuff is already um, born or encoded into our DNA and we each have unique DNA, but it's the way that we are taught to, to develop ourselves. And when we are triggered in some way, that part of our DNA is like somehow brought into our awareness. Yeah. It's so inspiring. I, that's why I always tell people, I don't care what you believe. It's not about what you believe in. It's right. It's about you and how you get to create the world we live in and how we get to do that together, you know? Um, and I just want to circle back because you mentioned the Hebrew alphabet, which it's just so, it's just perfect because I have been obsessed with that. And it's been maybe not even like maybe three months. I've really been like researching and getting into the vibrations of the Hebrew letters. Mm -hmm. And I just started studying um like the soul soul purpose plans which are taking your birth name as they are on your birth certificate putting them into a calculator that aligns the letters of your name with the hebrew alphabet what they would be in hebrew whoa that's and then cool it, it pulls up these codes these vibration <laughs> numbers of what your soul is activated to do here like pff, my mind is blown right i looked at mine i was like oh come on did it match? Oh, yeah. I mean, it describes me. My soul, your soul destiny is in the middle of this beautiful, um, like, Hebrew star. And in the middle is your soul destiny. My soul destiny is 6-6. Six, six, and sixes are the highest creative vibration. They're meant to create something new that hasn't been here before. 
right? So, so in like, numerology, no in numerology, I'm a six, but I don't like my life path is a six, but I don't know in like in Hebrew numerology what it would be. Well, we have to look at your. Yeah, I have to. We have to do this now. I'm yeah, I know. I was just like, she cannot be saying that right now. I mean, <laughs> like, some we are divinely connected. That's all I can say. We, you know. Oh, and you know, I, I totally think that, that we all are. So, all right. So, um, all right. So let, wrapping this up, like what is, we, we've talked about like your awakening and becoming a soul catalyst. And let's talk about the work that you do and how people can um, get in touch with you. Cause I know you have a current offering, including a six month one-on-one -on -one mentoring. And I would love to hear more about that. And we'll of course post the links for people. Sure, absolutely. So right now what it looks like is I do mainly work with people who identify as healers or artists themselves because that's who I resonate the most with. That's who I, who I seem to be here to help the most right now. And in this one-to-one -one mentorship, it's anybody anywhere in the world because it all happens on Zoom like we're on right now. And I literally, I, I, I can do like soul retrieval, power retrieval, like these huge activations shamanically just by being on Zoom with you. I mean, I don't, we don't even have to be on Zoom, but it's a really amazing thing to be able to connect this way. So I connect with my clients online and um, for a six month mentorship, it, I take you through a protocol and it's really all about releasing those older familial ancestral wounds. It's about forgiveness. It's about like consistently uh, being able to just forgive and let go and then moving into what your path is, right? Moving into, um, I think a lot of us can get really stuck in the past. We can identify ourselves based on what has happened, what could have happened, but didn't, you know, we have some breakdown stories that we identify ourselves with sometimes. And I'm really working to help people shift into abundance, into what am I creating? You know, what are my gifts and how do I move forward um, working with people if that's part of it, you know? And so I support people on clearing the future path. And I know you believe in manifestation and, and that, you know, it's all that. So I get to help heal, but I also get to be the catalyst for the major shift into abundance and kind of like going after your soul's purpose. What I love about your work is the, um, the forgiveness piece, because forgiveness and judgment, especially self-judgment are major pieces that I don't think that we talk a lot about when we talk about alignment. And so, you know, I remember when I was doing an interview with you and I was talking about alignment being this, like getting your thoughts, your words, your actions, your choices, yeah. all moving in the same direction as the goal or the thing that you want in life or the thing that you want to manifest. But another thing that, that I believe will, will keep you out of alignment with your true path is that if you have something from your past that you haven't forgiven and I'm, it's more like self-forgiveness, yeah. um, that if that is in your, your system, I think it really makes it difficult to be in true alignment because you're going to have so much judgment about that thing. And when you can really truly like not forgiveness as saying the words, but like really releasing it from your body, which is, which is something that I have found I've not been able to do on my own. So having a practitioner, because I have tried like, oh, I forgive this person or I've done journaling work on it. And let me tell you something. It is a very different experience when you're like saying you forgive yourself for this versus when you actually release it from your body. Because when you actually release it from your body, you're going to have more of a somatic experience. So you might cry, you might feel physical, physical pain. You might on some level, like re-experience that, that trauma that happened to you, you might re-experience the emotions. So this is really a huge offering. And I know that you also have a free gift for our viewers today. If you could please tell us about that. Yeah. So I am, um, it's a download, right? A so download. Yay. Oh, wow. <laughs> It's a heart light activation and clearing is what I, what I downloaded. It was called. I mean, sometimes when you download Mary, right, you have no idea. You're just like, okay, I'm just listening and I'm putting it out into the world. And, um, I love that this is something that my clients get when they work with me. I use this for like daily clearing. It's really about getting really clear about, you know, when you wake up in the morning and, 
you know, raise your hand if you ever wake up in anxiety in your to-do list. I mean, I do it all the time, right? But this is something, it's very short. I mean, I think it's like less than five minutes where I just take you through a meditation and it's really about clearing, it's about clearing um, your, your energetic space, but it's also, it, it ripples out and it affects like clearing your past and your karma and saying thank you to your ancestors and clearing the path in front of you, right? Opening the path in front of you so that you can connect with the people you're meant to connect with, be living in abundance, not worrying and living in fear, you know, but really living out your soul's purpose. So that's what that's for. And, you know, I, I would love to hear feedback if you use it, if it's helpful, if it's not, you know, I'd be curious. I will um, be doing this actually today. So we have, for people who are live with us on Zoom, we have put the links right in the chat box. We will also be putting it on the Facebook Live. And if you get the replay of this, we will put it in the email of the replay. Actually, all of you are getting the replay if you signed up for the webinar. So that's pretty awesome. All right, Christina, tell us where we can follow you and find you. Yeah, sure. So Christina Maglino, I mean, that's it. Facebook, um, that's my business page. Um, ChristinaMaglino.com is my, my website right now. We're completely changing the languaging, the copy on there. So it is, but it's still like one page and you can sign up for my mailing list and connect with me that way. And of course you can email me um, info at ChristinaMaglino.com about any of this. Um, if you know me, I, much like Mary, love to communicate. I love to check in and chat with people. Um, and anything we mentioned on here, please just hit me up. I'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah, you've, you've shared a lot. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful to connect with you again. And uh, I look forward to, I just look forward to following your journey and the book. And especially with respect to the proposal, I'm, I'm really appreciative that uh, you took a chance to uh, take my online class for aspiring authors. And I can't wait to uh, see your proposal when it's all finished. Thank you. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> All right, darling. So I will talk to you next time. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Hey, this is Mary. Thanks so much for watching. Check out a free chapter of my book, Conscious Communications at maryshores.com forward slash free chapter. The link is in the description below.